Welcome to Collecting Data. Some of the key ideas in this section is looking at how we collect our data, the method involved, and uh, of particular importance is we're, we're, try, we're striving for the gold standard, which is a simple random sample. Statistical methods, right, the, the types of things we can run are driven by the type of data that we have. If we have numerical data, we can do certain types of analyses. If we only have uh, qualitative data, then we're limited to only certain types of analyses. So the type of data we have really drives the type of analyses we can run. So oftentimes when we're designing our uh, research projects, we have to think about what kind of analyses we want to run and then make sure that we're collecting the appropriate kind of data. Now typically we only have two types of studies, observational studies and experiments. An observational study is where we're basically just watching things happen and we have no control over uh, modifying the path that things take. Whereas an experiment is where we have some sort of treatment effect that we give to one set of objects, subjects, normally human beings, and see if it causes a different trajectory, i.e. give one set of patients a placebo and give the other set of patients an actual drug and see if one has an effect on how quickly they recover from something. Here's an example of uh, the Pew Research Center surveying a bunch of people and finding out how many of them go online wirelessly and that's just an observational study because all we're doing is collecting data about a bunch of objects and we're not actually manipulating them or affecting them in any way. Whereas this is an example of a, an actual experiment because children were given a placebo and other children were given the Salk vaccine and seeing if there was a difference in, I believe this was polio. Convenient sampling is a type of sampling where all you're doing is collecting data from things that are convenient to you. So maybe you're just collecting sample from people in your class, people in your school, people in your building, people in your neighborhood, whatever it happens to be. Systematic sampling is where you have a, an, a group of data, objects, people, numbers, whatever, and you decide to pick every seventh number or every one hundredth number or every, you know, in this case, third number. A random sample is just sampling technique in which each item, or in this case members, has the same probability of being chosen. If you took your entire um, group of data and uh, numbered them, ordered them somehow, right? so you want to sample uh, people's salary and you've got a list of uh, five million people and all their salaries and you list them alphabetically by their last name then you decide to choose every tenth person and that's going to be your sample well that is technically a random sample because the ordering of them is really random you I know you're thinking no it's not random it was alphabetical by their last name yes that's true but the amount of money that they each earn the numbers now are correlated to you know are, are matched to those people that really is a random list because it was just ordered by their last name you could have just as easily ordered it by their social security number or I don't know where they live so the ordering was still random and then the idea that you chose every tenth was also random you could have chosen every eleventh or every one hundredth so each so if you choose every tenth each person still had the same random chance of being that tenth person right so there was still a one out of ten chance for each thing to be chosen simple random sample is is different it has to be random you know so each person still has that one out of ten chance of being chosen but each sample that you choose so let's say you're going to choose a hundred people each sample of size 100 has to have that same chance of being chosen and in the previous example that's not true because if you think of um, one sample you know one possible sample being uh, the first 100 people then th the probability of the first 100 people being chosen is impossible right because you're choosing every tenth person and so you can't choose any two things that are next to each other stratified sampling is our next type of sampling technique where you take your items and you group them in this case they're only grouped by gender but you could group by multiple ways it doesn't have to be just two so you could think of grouping people by uh, political affiliation republican democrat independent right there's three and then you uh, take a random sample of each of those three groups <clears throat> 
cluster sampling is similar yet quite different. You're still taking all of your um, items and putting them in groups. This time we're calling them clusters. But then instead of randomly sampling from each of the clusters, you choose a random selection of clusters and then take all of the items from each cluster. So you could think of this as uh, being maybe voting districts. So you take all the voting districts in the state of Washington, you randomly choose three of those voting districts, and then you sample every person in each of those three voting districts. That would be a, a version of cluster sampling. Multi-stage sampling is just simply uh, using more than one of the techniques together, right? So you sample one way and then you sample another way. Here's a summary of those basic sampling techniques that we've seen, the convenience, systematic, etc., etc., where the SRS is the gold standard we're always striving for. Now, beyond the basics, most of you can probably stop the video at this point. This is just um, for some of the more advanced um, statistical collecting techniques. Cross-sectional study, right? Data are observed or collected um, at one point in a time. So an example of that would be um, looking at the association between obesity and television watching. So you could maybe take a sample of people from the population that are interested um, and can be polled and asked about their uh, height weight ratio and the number of hours they watch. And so it's basically giving you a snapshot picture of people who watch TV and whether or not they're obese. Right. So data is being um, collected and measured at one point in time. A retrospective study is um, where you go back through records and see if there's a relationship between things. So maybe you think that um, people with lower SAT scores are more likely to um, be involved in car accidents. Then you go back through the records and look at everybody who's been involved in car accidents in the last 25 years and see if there's a relationship between that and their SAT scores. A prospective or longitudinal study is extremely powerful very time consuming, very expensive, and therefore very rare. Most people don't take the time and energy to do it, but it is very powerful. You can collect some great data. It's where you follow a co cohort or a group of um, individuals over a long period of time. And there are a lot of these in um, social sciences and uh, medicine. They're looking at people over 25 years to see if, for instance, cell phone usage um, results in higher cases of uh, cancers, those types of things. Some of the designs of experiments, randomization, you want to make sure that your subjects are randomly assigned to each group. Replication is um, making sure that um, you're doing it on more than one subject, right? So like the SALT vaccine, you had a very large sample size. So you want to make sure that those sample sizes are large enough so that you can actually see if there are effects coming from the vaccine or not. Blinding is where um, the subject doesn't know whether they're getting the placebo or the, the drug. And then double blinding is where both the subjects don't know and the experimenters who are conducting it don't know. A confounding uh, variable is something that I talked about before. The idea of um, every time uh, ice cream sales go up, that uh, murder rates go up. Well, the confounding variable there, the thing that's acting on both of them was weather. Trying to control effects of variables, if you have a completely randomized experimental design where you're assigning subjects to these different treatment groups through this random selection process, that helps to control for uh, various effects. And if you do a randomized block design where you block subjects based on how they're similar, you know, so maybe you're blocking subjects by smoking levels, low, medium, and high, and then you're running an experiment on those three blocks, it helps you to see if uh, smoking has an effect. Matched pairs design is where you basically just have two groups that are matched up on some sort of similar characteristics. Maybe you're working with twins and you put one, you know, half of each twin pair in one group and half in the other. Um, and then a rigorously controlled design is exactly what it sounds like. You're just, you know, trying to make sure that subjects um, are getting the different treatments. In summary, uh, there's three important considerations when you're um, designing your experiment. You want to make sure that you're using randomization, so each uh, subject is randomly assigned to group. You're using replication, which just means you're having um, a large enough 
sample so that you can actually see effects of treatments and that you try to control the best you can for the effects of other variables by using such techniques as blinding and, and things like that. Even with all that said, there are still errors that can happen. You can have a sampling error where the difference between a sample result and the true population result, um, and, and that's just from pure chance of having a weird sample. Uh, for instance, you want to know the average height of a bunch, uh, the average height of an American, adult American male, and you just happen to sample a bunch of NBA players, then you're going to get a result that is not truly indicative of the population. Non-sampling errors um, are basically human errors, where your sample was good, but when you were recording the data, you had a problem. Either your measurements were faulty, or you just entered the data improperly and things like that. And uh, that's everything.